Well, hello and welcome. And you are not imagining things. We are back with another AASR Live. Uh, of course, this is not our usual time or, well, it is our usual day, but we're usually here every other Thursday. But we have a, uh, a special uh, show today, which I'm really excited about. And I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. But of course, my name is Guy Stevens. I am the founder and executive director of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. And of course, we are an organization that formed about four and a half years ago. Uh, initially, we really were focused on restraint seclusion and happy in schools around the country. Uh, but as does happen, our, our mission continue to grow and evolve. Uh, it's not just about, you know, restraint seclusion happening in schools. We don't want to see these things happening anywhere, whether it be residential facilities, elder care, uh, acute psychiatric care, uh, we believe in so many cases we can do so much better. Uh, but of course, it's not just about restraint and seclusion. In a school, it might be restraint, seclusion, suspension, expulsion, corporal punishment. Uh, it might be kids kind of being moved down the school to prison pipeline. Uh, it's often what happens or what is done to kids in the name of behavior. And it's this foundational belief that we have that we can do better. We can do better for kids. We can do better for teachers and staff. Uh, we can do really better for everyone. So uh, if you're not familiar with us, by all means, go check out our website. And we've got a lot of... Uh, uh, we've got a lot of podcasts back in our uh, our uh, directory as well, so I encourage you to go check them out on YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, or Facebook. So today is a special event. Uh, I am going to introduce you in a moment to our special guest, Dr. Lori Desitels, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Dr. Lori in a moment. But we are having uh, really a candid conversation about restraint seclusion uh, from really a neuroscience perspective and really excited about this conversation. Uh, Lori and I have been collaborating for quite some time. And uh, when we began having some conversations around this, Lori's like, I want to have a conversation. Let's do a live. And uh, that's what we're going to be doing today. So uh, with all that, a couple logistics here. Uh, these shows, as always, are being recorded. So if you're not able to watch the entire thing right now, uh, rest assured, you can go back later and watch it on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, or you can even download it as an audio podcast. So if you want to listen to it on the go, you can do that as well. So with all the intro out of the way, let's get to the exciting part here. And I want to introduce to you uh, my, my friend, my colleague, uh, someone that I admire immensely, uh, Dr. Lori Desitels. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Lori. Uh, and, you know, Lori and I were talking. She's like, you don't have to read my whole bio. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just kind of wing it a little bit. Uh, but let me tell you uh, a little bit about Lori. Uh, I've known Lori Gosh now for probably over four years. Uh, time kind of ticks away quickly. Uh, Lori, of course, I had the opportunity to learn about her work and, uh, you know, the things that she's been doing and teaching and her experiences. Uh, and one of my, my earliest um, uh, exposures was actually through one of my favorite books in the world, which is Connections Over Compliance, uh, which was a fantastic book. And of course, all it took was reading the uh, the title of this uh, because it so much resonated with the work that we were doing at the Alliance. And uh, what I've come to learn about Dr. Lori is that her work in applied educational neuroscience is really amazing and changing the world. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, Lori has experience as an educator, uh, spends time, you know, now in the classroom as well, you know, creates these these amazing uh, books, which offer so much insight and uh, so much uh, really fantastic knowledge to help us to understand our, our brain and body and our nervous system, and, and really to have a different look at ourselves and, and really all the people that we interact with, whether it's children or coworkers or whatever it may be. Uh, so uh, Lori, of course, has written a couple of books. I mentioned Connections Over Compliance. Most recently, uh, this amazing book, which is Intentional Neuroplasticity. Uh, and all of us probably that are watching this today are are aware of how trauma can impact the brain and the the negative effects that can come from trauma. And, and I look at this book, Intentional Neuroplasticity, as a book about hope, a book about how uh, not only can trauma affect our brains in, in ways that can be harmful, uh, we have this amazing capability that uh, I've learned more and more about from Dr. Laura's work about how we can actually change our brain uh, as well in a positive way. So anyway, my, my introduction is probably going to get longer than if I had read the whole thing. But I just mm -hmm. want to share with you uh, really this amazing person. And of course, Lori does a program uh, in applied educational neuroscience, uh, which, uh, gosh, you've been doing now for five 
Yeah. Eight years. Yeah. Eight years. Wow. Wow. Even longer. Uh, applied educational neuroscience was a program that uh, you started at Butler University, and and this program uh, again. I've had the honor of meeting many people that have gone through the program. And, you know, what we always say is that, you know, all, all the people I've met, Lori, through your program are people that are, you know, changing the world and, and you know, have all expressed the experience that they have had, uh, you know, in that program and how life-changing it was. In fact, uh, we were on a book study last night and one of our volunteers, uh, Val Luther, is on, on the program. And uh, one of the participants, Danielle, who is just amazing, uh, has been in a bunch of our book studies. She's in your program. You know, so we have all these people that are doing this. So let me wrap it up. Uh, Lori, you are an amazing gift to the world. Um, the work that you're doing is is truly leading to better outcomes uh, for kids, for for teachers, for really all of us. And uh, excited to have you here for a, a really, um, I think, meaningful conversation today. So all that said, Lori, I went longer than I probably should have, but yet you had me talking from the heart here. So I hope the intro was okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thank you so much. And I just want to give all that back to you because you are so gracious with um, your time, your energy, your passion. And, um, and it's just, you're on fire with this work. And um, I think both, you know, I think everyone can agree, you know, all, all of us know that um, you too are a gift, a huge gift to this work. And um, yeah. We're just super, super fortunate to sit beside you. So thank uh, I, you. I appreciate that, and you know, uh, I think one of the um, one of the things that gives me a lot of hope is to to be able to work with with people like you, and and you know, many of the the students that I've I've worked with from your your cohorts. Uh, and when we come together, we can do meaningful things. I do want to mention here before we get started in our conversation that uh, if you're watching live, and it looks like we've got quite a few people. Um, you know, people that are in our community kind of uh, are already a step ahead of me. Uh, I usually tell people to tell us who they are and where they're from in the chat. And I see a number of people have already done that. Uh, Jennifer Abinat, who I believe you know as well, uh, from Davis, California, uh, another another amazing change maker. Uh, Jamie from Nashville and uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Adele from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we've got uh, Trish here from Indiana. Uh, and uh, happy to be here. We've got, um, oh, from Charlotte's, uh, Sheridan from Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Uh, so a number of people have already jumped on and are telling us where they're from. And uh, uh, we've got somebody here from uh, Canada as well. And on cue, from all the way over in Australia, we have uh, Gail Quigley, who is a volunteer with the Alliance and who is up very early in the morning to watch this. So, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, across the, uh, across the world, we've got people that are here to listen to you. And of course, from South Dakota, uh, Indianapolis, Minnesota, lots of people joining on with us here live today. So Lori, let's just give a little bit of, um, background to this conversation. Um, you know, you and, you know, I've had the, the privilege of, collaborating with you for quite some time. Uh, I think I've shared with you before you, you've actually been our most frequent guest on this program and I've lost track. It's probably about eight times that you've been on with us. And uh, every time I get an email or a call from you saying, Hey, we should, we should, we should get together and do something on this. I get excited. Um, you know, because I think these conversations are really important, but you and I were recently talking about some of the work we're doing around, you know, really, addressing issues around restraint and seclusion. And of course, um, you uh, and I were able to meet in Virginia a few months back and uh, actually film a little bit of a, for a documentary that we're working on about restraint and seclusion. And uh, more recently in our conversation, uh, after kind of talking about the problem, I think I'd shared with you some articles about um, restraint and seclusion in Indiana, you know, you know your, your home state. And uh, you're like, I want to do something. I want to have... Um, and, and dogs are always welcome, by the way, you know that, um, <laughs> we're very dog friendly, but you know, you, you reach out and said, Hey, I really want to have a candid conversation about this. I want, I want to, you know, kind of share that through kind of a, uh, neuroscience lens and, and the work that you do. So you had really, um, 
prompted us to to schedule this event and and talk about this. So I want to let you kind of get started because you also mentioned to me uh, when I had the the uh, privilege of running into you in person uh, in Indianapolis, um, you know things that you have been thinking about in terms of you know how to kind of talk about this topic and get into it. And of course, it is it, it's a tough topic. Uh, you know when we're talking about you know kids being restrained and secluded. Uh, we're talking about, you know, things that are being done often in the name of crisis intervention, um, often in the name of behavior, but they're, they're being done in situations that, you know, are also unsafe to staff and, and you know, often uh, the things that people know, um, maybe what they've been doing may not be actually helping the situation. And it's really tough, regardless of what side of the situation you may be on. Uh, I always like to remind people that, um, you know, these things are not only traumatic for kids, not only traumatic for families, but also traumatic for for educators and others that might find themselves in these situations. So let me let you kind of uh, kick off the, the conversation and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, thank you, Guy. And I, I told Guy before when we were ch- chatting, I have notes today. Um, there, there's so much that I, I want to condense and share and to be very specific. And then I want to leave time at the end also um, for some practices. Like some, I want to move in the direction of growth and solution and resiliency and, um, you know, and really say, okay, now what? But um, I, I want to start, Guy, with um, this was an article that was written by Larry Brintrow and Martin Brokenleg, who is a Native American psychologist. And it was written, I'm not even sure, here, 1997. So, you know, we're going back 30 years. But it's one that I pull up every single year. And um, I've read it probably 10 times and I take a new, I print it out and I underline because I'm not ready to hear some of the aspects of it until the time that I read it. So I wanna begin today just sharing the opening of this article. And Dr. And Martin Brokenleg shares as we approach, and this is, I'm saying we are approaching the third decade of the millennium. We applaud so many scientific achievements. Yet, in so many discussions about punishment, one still finds enthusiastic support from adults. So I want to just really explore questions at the beginning of our discussion today. What sustains this antiquated practice of punishment in the face of all of the scientific evidence to the contrary? So I think, you know, we need to really, we need to ask the questions. What societal values and personal belief systems and theories anchor our cultures below the waterline of reason in this realm of human experience? And I think about that a lot. What thinking errors are used to uphold the belief that harsh punishment is effective in fighting defiance and delinquency in our own youth? And then finally, Martin Broken Leg observed that each of us, this is me because I'm I'm telling you today, I am a recovering reactive punisher. I was as a mom, I was as a teacher of children with the classification of emotionally disturbed. I isolated them in the late eighties and early nineties. I restrained them. I felt sick to my stomach almost every single time that I kept doing it because I believed that if the consequence was painful enough, if it was uncomfortable enough, the behavior would lessen. And so what Martin Brokenleg states, and this is the last piece of this article that I want to share, each of us drags behind us a cultural tale, T-A-I-L, a thousand years long, And this tale blends with our own child rearing experiences. It's a personal tale to shape our beliefs about discipline. And when we go back those thousands of years, when Europeans invaded North America, they brought a different ethos, namely that children must always obey adults. The history of child rearing in pre-democratic Europe is a litany of coercion with fear and punishment that has been carried down 
um, to 2023. So, you know, as we think about this, um, these practices of seclusion and restraint, and we think about, and Guy, you said it so well, it's not just seclusion and restraint, it's um, these, the, the punitive practice of suspension, expulsion. Um, we now have growing research that many of these punitive practices are with younger children. Many of these punitive practices are targeting our black and brown children. Um, I'm going to put in boys specifically and also our special education population. And it is challenging and it is worrisome. So I wanted to have this conversation today, not because I'm a neuroscientist, but because from the research of neuroscience, we now understand and we now know that our nervous systems worsen, our nervous systems are negatively impacted, our biology is negatively impacted when we are using these traditional punitive mm. practices. Mm -hmm. So I want to share today a little bit about what's happening in the brain and body. Yeah, it's, it's such a powerful lead into all of this. And, you know, I can't tell you, Lori, how many times I've had this thought run through my head that, you know, here we are in 2023. Um, and, you know, here in the United States, we still have schools that are permitted to hit children in the name of discipline, in the name of punishment. And, and it pains me to know all of the information, all of the things that we know and, and we know better. And of course, you know, I think you and I and, and probably everybody else that's watching this today uh, would agree with this idea that, you know, this isn't about judgment. This isn't about, you know, uh, condemning people that are doing things differently than we are, but it's about when we know better, we do better. And, and the question is, how do we spread that awareness? How do we how do we help more people to to know better? And you know the the impact not only on the children due to the punitive discipline, but as you pointed out in that article, the impact on the adults, the adult nervous system. Um, this is really a change that supports all of us and is so critical. So anyway, I just I just been reflecting on that. I mean, it's so powerful. And 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 when you said uh, 1997 and said 30 years, of course that. That scared me because 1997 to me wasn't that long ago. But, no. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's it's so I mean, if you think about uh, areas of achievement in the last 30 years and, and many things that have been uh, accomplished in society and, and, you know, medicine, whatever field you want to look at, uh, there's a lot of tremendous leaps forward. But then to have this prevailing punitive mindset around discipline, it, it's almost shocking. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I just want to just give huge gratitude to the researchers and the scientists like Dr. Bruce Perry, um, you know, like Dr. Stephen Porges, um, you know, so many, Dr. Peter Levine, um, Bessel van der Kolk. I mean, we just, you know, we go on and on because they are providing um, the sound, robust literature that informs us as educators. And so what I've tried to do this afternoon is to really pick and choose, because as Dr. Perry says, you know, we're on inch two of a 10 mile journey with what we know about the nervous system and every model is inaccurate. It's very schematic when we talk about it. So I'm gonna be very schematic. I just wanna share that today. You know, the brain doesn't work in regions or systems. But I'm always very careful and very aware and intentional about how we use the neuroscience because I'm not a neuroscientist. And um, and so, you know, as we think about um, children and and, you know, we know that our five and six and seven and eight year olds are that's a huge population of children that are being secluded mm -hmm. and restrained. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what it's suspended, expelled and called out. Um, the brain is developing and the nervous system is developing. And so, you know, our, I, I want to begin by saying our nervous systems are social structures. And this is huge for us to think about today. You know, I, and the nervous system finds stability and it finds balance with others. And when we are isolating, when we are restraining, when we are sending away children and adolescents 
who are literally, their nervous systems are the stickiest for experiences. We are unintentionally re-traumatizing and activating their stress response systems. So I also want to begin, Guy, today with, it is well, well known that there are three conditions that the brain and, and also the nervous system cannot take. And this is true for adults. So, you know, as we think about, and, and I also want to say, this is not about blame or shame here. I, I'm a mom who has consequenced punitively. I am a teacher that has secluded and restrained. So I'm not my fingers are not pointed today to anyone. I just, I'm learning every day. But I want to share these three conditions because when you think about punitive practices in our schools, in our communities, these three conditions are, are I mean, we impact these conditions. So I want to begin with um, the very first one, and that is chronic unpredictability. That is something that a developing brain cannot take. Um, and, and when adults are in survival, when I am in my fight flight, when I am escalated, I don't reason, I'm not logical, I don't think clearly, and I'm extremely unpredictable. I was as a teacher and I was as a mom. You know, we don't, we don't have the capability to sit back and to, you know, to really think about our words and, and we're, we are unaware in a survival state of our tone, of our gestures, of our posture. I mean, I'm so glad there are not video recordings of me parenting my own three children when I was escalated. Um, you know, and as a teacher of children with the classification of emotionally disturbed. So chronic unpredictability is also an aspect of every one of the adverse childhood experiences. So this is really important for us to think about today. The second condition that the nervous system cannot take is isolation. And for the reason I began with today is that our nervous systems are social structures. We depend on one another for stability and for balance. You know, we cannot survive without another. So when we isolate, it is terrifying to the developing nervous system. And then the third condition that the nervous system and brain cannot take is physical restraint and emotional restraint. And I wrote about this last night and I put it on social media. And this is from Andrew Huberman's research and, and also uh, Dr. Feldman's research in the 1930s. And so what we know is that in a heightened stress response, we have excessive carbon dioxide in our bodies. And that carbon dioxide creates irritation. It creates angst. And, and we now understand through research that we can rinse that carbon dioxide through movement. In fact, we talked about this, Danielle's on, we have a couple of my graduate students on right now. We talked about this this summer. There's also a little tiny norepinephrine cell in the base of the brain that is called the locus ceruleus. It's a part of the brain stem and it has receptors for serotonin. And when we exercise, when we move our bodies, not exercise, when we take a five minute walk, when we, we walk with our kids down the hallway, when we take deep breaths, we can literally lessen and dampen down our stress response systems by releasing some of that carbon dioxide. So chronic unpredictability, isolation, and physical restraint, even emotional restraint, is impacted in these punitive practices, and it literally worsens the conditions of the behaviors that mm -hmm. we are so misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. um, and and with, the, with the emotional restraint, when a child is unable to say comfortably and freely what they need, what they, what, what feels, uh, I'm going to use the word soothing to them when they can't say what they need, their authenticity is compromised. Mm -hmm. And every single human being will always choose attachment over authenticity because attachment 
is a basic need. Attachment is the developer of the nervous system. So I will do anything to belong if, if, if I, even if I feel like what's happening is wrong, I, I won't, I won't want my personhood called out. So, you know, those, and, and Dr. Gabor Mate talks about this, that attachment and authenticity are, are our two greatest needs. And when we are physically and emotionally restraining, then we are, you know, we are not only escalating the stress response systems, but it is much harder for us to ask for what we need. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and that's really important for teachers and for parents to understand. You made a, a point, um, and this is a point that, uh, uh, you know, I think is really important that, you know, these things that are often being done, uh, you know, things like restraint seclusion, um, ultimately are likely to result in an increase in, in stress related behaviors and stress responses. And, and, you know, what we find sometimes is that, uh, and, and somebody mentioned this in the chat about the number of times that they had been, uh, restrained and secluded. And, and I'm really sorry to, to hear that that was their experience, but we often find that, that, uh, people are doing these things repeatedly. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it really goes counter. I mean, if, if you're, your goal um, is to help someone who's having a difficult time and exhibiting behavior. You don't want to do something that's going to make it more prevalent, but that's exactly what happens here when you're doing these things, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and again, not to blame, um, but you know, we, the reasoning and the logistics of this and the emotional regulation of the adult comes from when we step away and we are aware of our own nervous system. Right. And um, in the heat of the moment, um, you know, none of us do well in survival. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we all are, you know, reacting, talking louder, talking faster, right. consequencing and, and, and feel like this insurmountable loss of control or power. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know you've got a lot to cover, and I just want to ask one more question, uh, kind of related to what you were talking about. Um, one of the things that um, probably probably others that are on this uh, call can, can relate to um, is that there sometimes is a blind spot to trauma that is inflicted on children uh, in places that are there to help them. And what I mean is that uh, sometimes we don't think that a kid could be traumatized by what happened at school or what happens in a, a medical setting, but in fact, those can be quite traumatizing things. So when we're talking about, you know, restraint and seclusion, uh, you know, we actually, believe it or not, hear people that question whether or not they're traumatizing. And of course, you said those three three, three things that the human brain uh, really can't tolerate can you speak a little bit about the impact of using restraint and seclusion and, and how that changes, uh, you know, how, I mean, getting back to what we said a minute ago, but how that changes uh, and impacts an individual that has experienced it? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, I do, I want to talk about that. And, and remember too, that I was, you know, trauma happens on a continuum. Mm-hmm. And so in, I read this week, somebody in an article said, there's no such thing as a small trauma. And I so agree with that. Um, you know, trauma, as we've heard from Dr. Porges and Dr. Gabor Mate say, trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the children and the adolescents that are, ex- that are going through these seclusions and restraints and, and I say this every everywhere I travel, if you look at your discipline data in your schools and, and, you know, and if you are a teacher or even in my own home, I mean, I looked at the things that we were using as disciplinary measures and, and they weren't working because we were not, the behavior, you know, was not getting better. But if you look at your discipline data, the children and the adolescents that were struggling in August were struggling in October they were struggling in January and they were struggling in May and they left you at the end of last school year and they still were, were cha- the, the behaviors were present. So school, even though it is a place, it is, you know, a, hopefully a place of um, external and relational and in, meaning environmental support, 
Um, we are a child's relational field. Mm -hmm. As a teacher, I am that child's, um, you know, I'm, I'm there for them. And, and so, and it doesn't mean that I am excusing behaviors or that I am agreeing, but what we now understand is that school can be a very traumatizing place for our children where adults are not understanding that behavior management is about the adult. Right. It is right. not about the child. And, and so when, you know, when we deeply embody and this is the key word here. When I embody that my tone of voice can set a child off, that my physiological presence can throw a child into an implicit memory. And this is what I want to talk about, Guy, um, that my gesturing and my posture can activate a child's stress response system even though I didn't mean to do that. I mean, none of us wake up in the morning thinking that, you know, we're going to send a kid out in the hall or we're going to suspend them. Um, you know, this it's, it, and I, I don't want to, this is so hard. You've got 30 kids in a classroom or 40 kids in a classroom and, and you have the responsibility to teach, but, but I want to share this piece of this today. It can be very traumatizing for a child who um, experiences being called out, being clipped down, having their behavior shown in front of the entire class, being sent away. All of these punitive practices can create a traumatic response. And, and so, and I wanna be very clear about this. Trauma isn't actually held in the muscles or the bones. When we say trauma is held in the body, I want to be very clear about this. It's not that it's held in the muscles and bones. Instead, the need to protect oneself from perceived threats is stored in the amygdala, in the brain, and in the memory and emotional centers of the brain. And so when a situation happens where a child is reminded if there is a tone of voice, if there is the height of a person who is standing over a student, if there is a white van driving across a parking lot, if there is an ambulance siren, um, a person walking down the hall, slamming a door, all of those sensory pieces can literally activate a behavior from a child or adolescent's past that for them, it feels like the trauma is happening mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now in this mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And of course that's not cognitive. So, you know, I mean, we're, yeah. we're, you know, it can be something that doesn't even make sense to us. Right. So, um, you know, maybe a child had a bad experience with law enforcement and, and to, to one person seeing somebody in uniform might be reassuring to another, it might signal a threat. And it's okay. not a kind of like, let me look at this and think about it, but just a smell, a taste, uh, you know, something in the air. I mean, so many things can bring that back. Right. Yeah. And I, I read this last night. I thought this was, that's exactly right. And, um, you know, in what happens in trauma is that those experiences get fragmented. And I was reading last night, it's like shrapnel. Mm. And I've never heard of that, you know, analogy before, but those fragments and those fragments are images and they are sensory experiences. So when our brains and bodies, when our nervous systems have gone through a traumatic time, then the method of remembering them gets distorted and okay. it fragments out. And so those fragments act like shrapnel, mm. which can hinder the brain's natural recovery process. Mm. So those fragments will manifest as symptoms that we mm. punish. And I'm not excusing the behavior, but we have to understand that they are, they are so misunderstood. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and all of us can remember um, times when we've gone through a sliver of trauma, you know, all of us, experience, you don't go through life without adversity and, and traumatic experiences happening. <laughs> if you look back on that trauma, we, we don't really have a narrative for it. Right, right, um, right. You know, we don't have a story for it, but we do just as you said, guy, a smell we can remember, um, <laughs> just looking at holiday cookies, 
um, as I use, or hearing tire screech, or um, right. you know, right. seeing you know a fork, um, you know, so or somebody's posture or someone's somebody like, wearing medical scrubs. Some, you know, I mean, it could be so many different things. And you know, it's interesting. You know, you talk about memory, and and even even the best case scenario, I think people often have misconceptions about how our memory works. I remember reading a fantastic book years ago. It was by Dan Daniel Kahneman, I believe it was. It's called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And it talked about memory. And it, it talked about really the fact that our memories are not necessarily what we think they are. They're not these continuous full stories, but in fact, they're often, they're often fragmented. And, and what happens is all of us, whether we're adults or kids, um, as we, we recall a memory, we, we sometimes are filling those in with other pieces of information that make a story out of it and may not in fact be consistent with what actually happened. So, you know, memory is such a funny thing. And of course, we know that trauma affects memory as well. Um, so there, there's so much there that's, that's really interesting. Well, and Bessel van der Kolk made the statement, and I love this. He says that trauma comes back as a reaction, not right. a memory. You know, and, and those reactions, we misunderstand. And I've said this for so long, you know, if if we're only looking at the behavior, um, you know, we're, we're missing that that nervous system, you know, all right. behavior in Mona right. Delahook says this, you know, her wonderful work, you know, she says behavior is just <clears throat> an indicator or a signal right. Right. of you know, that the nervous system is struggling. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I like, um, you know, I mean, people often say behavior is communication. Um, I like uh, Stuart Schenker uh, often talks about like behaviors biology, right? Th there's all this that's below behavior. And if, if you're asking a kid, like, why did you do this? Uh, guess what? The kid might not even know when you're talking about, you know, trauma, you're talking about something comes back as a reaction. It's not cognitive. It's not, I planned this. I thought it, I did it. It's, gosh, something set off my threat detection system. I didn't feel safe. And this is what happened, right? Um, so I think even our expectations are sometimes really misaligned. Uh, and we, we want to think that, you know, I mean, not only do we want to think the kids have fully developed prefrontal cortexes like an adult would, but, you know, my, my son, I remember when he was young and would occasionally have a difficult time with something, you'd ask him, you know, like, well, why did you do that? I don't know. My brain made me do it. And that I don't know, my brain made me do it is so profound when I reflect on it because yeah. so much of what we do, it's it's not. And, and, and of course, we would expand that to say our brain and our nervous system and our senses and, you know, sensations and feelings. Right. That, no, exactly. I love that. You know, and you're exactly right. I mean, you know, and, and the other thing that I was thinking about, you know, before as we prepare, as I prepared for our conversation today is that. <laughs> You know, we really live in a cortical cognitive centric world. And so I just want to give grace, you know, to all educators out there and to parents. You know, we 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 come into the world and, you know, at, in utero and as infants, we identify with our sensory systems. But as we are conditioned, you know, into experiences out in the world, it's like our heads go one way and our bodies go the other. And so when you are, you know, when, when we are disconnected from our body and, and, you know, and we're, we're just, we are just kind of thinking, talking, reacting, threatening, nagging, yelling, using words and language, the behavior can oftentimes look intentional mm -hmm. and the behavior can also look manipulative. Mm -hmm. Um, because we're so focused on reason and learning and, and, and forgetting that implicit memories are those emotional sensory memories that the brain couldn't process for a lot of reasons. And they fragmented. So the tension, the tightness, the tears, the buzzing in the ears, the sweating, the rapid heartbeat all of those sensory experiences feel and tell the body you're not safe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You are. And so we then see a child or adolescent running, fighting, um, and, and, and reacting in a way as if, as if there was that traumatic event happening. And I know I said this, but the hippocampus, which is our little, sits next to the amygdala 
in the limbic system, they work together to process emotional memory. And when there is trauma, it is, it, it overwhelms that area of the nervous system and the memory cannot be time stamped. And I think that's a really great way to explain it. Dr. Albert Wong talks about that in his work and that, and, and Bruce Perry says the brainstem doesn't tell time. So it, it's, it's like, it's happening all over again. Mm. Um, you know, and, and the other thing that I, I want to share really quickly is that in trauma, which, you know, is in a survival state, just as, you know, a, a, this activated stress response where our windows of tolerance are non-existent or so small, mm -hmm. um, our physiology, and this is what we have to understand, our physiology is in a state of threat. And I'm not excusing the behavior. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, a child or ad adolescent doesn't need to repair, or they don't need to, you know, to follow through with a plan. But What's happening with seclusion and restraint and punitive practices is that we have a very dysregulated adult mm -hmm. that is unintentionally, hopefully, re-traumatizing this child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, is, this goes back to me. This goes back to us. It is about the adult nervous system. I, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. I'm, I, I'm learning every day that I... And, and you've heard me say this guy at so many presentations. What I'm thinking about this year as school has begun here is when I'm in the classroom, is my nervous system capable or strong enough to hold this child and myself for a minute or two? Hmm. That is discipline. That is discipline. That is where we begin to embody the experience and really to really desire so much more than compliance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If yeah. I can hold that child for a moment and share my nervous system, then we're moving in the direction of growth rather in states of protection. Right. And, and, and sharing hopefully a well-regulated nervous system and how much a difference that can make to somebody that's that's having a hard time. You know, I, I was, uh, and I think I shared this with you, um, uh, we were in uh, Houston together and you were presenting and as you were presenting, something struck me. And you know how you have these things that strike you and they're, maybe they're not really that ground shaking, but at the moment it's just like, it hits like a lightning bolt. And, and, you know, the, the realization that I had, in fact, I was presenting later that day. And I remember uh, after you, you said what you said, it led to this thought. I'm like, oh, I got to put that in my presentation later. Um, but, but really, the, the, and I'm trying to remember the, the exact point that you made. And I don't know if I remember that. But what it led me to is this idea that um, people don't even realize that very often the, the consequence, the punishment, the thing that, you know, they may want to do to someone for whatever they did, they don't realize how, in fact, dysregulating that is. When you're putting punitive consequences on people, when you're punishing them, it's dysregulating. And, and what happens, of course, is, you know, that dysregulated nervous system, that that punishment may even to a degree be traumatizing to a kid. And, and then, of course, we're, we're feeding into stress responses. So the more yeah. we do these things, the more we're feeding into these responses and then we're seeing the yeah. same thing. And our, and our discipline data shows that. I, I right. say to every school. Yep. And our children that are, um, you know, being constantly, you know, secluded or restrained or, or even expelled right. and suspended or called out or clipped down or, right. you, know, you know, when we are only focusing on the behaviors, we are leaving out the private logic of a child. Mm -hmm. And so we, somebody may, like, I think maybe Bessel van der Kolk calls that a child or adolescent's perceptual map. I love the term private logic because the logic of children and adolescents, the logic of adults that have experienced um, adverse, you know, ex like, you know, whether they are relational adverse experiences, external you know, adverse experiences or internal, like meaning a surgery, a sickness, those experiences shape our nervous system. And, and remember that our autonomic nervous system is a human lab. 
Think about that. You know, it is a lab. And so when we think about the nervous system, it has plasticity, but it's very hard for our nervous system to find homeostasis or a balance when we're in survival. <laughs> so, you know, I told, so I, I want to think about and Bruce Perry talks about this a lot, you know, get to know the history of a child. So I think it's even deeper than the history. I think we have to understand the private logic of a child. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is for some of our kids, their private logic is I don't trust one damn adult. Right. And why should I? Right. Why should I? Here's another piece of private logic. You know, why would I soften my defenses for anybody that I don't trust? or that, or for anyone who is going to hurt me, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's, life is about perception, you know, perception right. Right. that it's not about it. Our perception is built from our embodied experiences. Right, right, right. You know, from our generational trauma, from our evolutionary biology, even right. take it out there, right. you know, we are, you know, we are constantly, you know, looking at, like the human nervous system is all about survival. Right. Nothing right. more. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I was reading one point, uh, Robert Sapolsky's work, which I think, as I recall, you have right behind you there, uh, behave. And, and I remember, um, you know, kind of that point that it's like genetics and experience, right? You can have the genetics, but until you have the experience, sometimes there are things that will become, um, that, that, that will be, um, come to the forefront with the experience that you've had. So, you know, yeah. certain people, and of course we, we all respond to experiences differently. Um, but we all also have different genetic makeup. We have, you know, kind of the field of epigenetics is getting interesting as well. There's a lot that's going on there that's below the surface. Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, when you think about, um, you know, I was Dr. Jim Bean, who is um, not Jim Bean, but Jim Bean. And I, we always I thought that. you said Jim Bean, but I'm like, oh, wait, isn't that a whiskey? <laughs> but he's a pediatrician that okay. um, worked with closely in the, the certification at Butler. And, um, you know, and he was sharing with our graduate students in the past that, you know, there's a step, at least a 17 year gap between what the medical field and the medical science, you know, is exposing and sharing and the, you know, and, and doing incredible research compared to how physicians practice today. And, you know, and he said, you, you know, he looked at my graduate students a few years ago and he spoke at Butler and he said, can you imagine what it is for us as educators, you know, with 17 years. So, you know, what, how I was prepared in my pre-service years, mm -hmm. how I was trained, um, we did not know, uh, like teachers didn't, were not prepared to teach to the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, again, like you said, Guy, it even goes, I wish I could think of something different. Like, yes, when you know better, you do better, but you know, also it's when you embody the research then you embody solutions. Right, right. Well, it, it starts with you, right? So if it doesn't start with you, you, you can't become, I mean, this is, this is something I think you can't become a practitioner of if you're not actually applying it to yourself, right? If you're not able to take the, the ideas uh, and understand your own body, brain, nervous system connections, uh, it's not just the skill that you can master without kind of bringing it into your own, right? Absolutely. And this is something that, you know, I, and I really want, you know, I, I'm learning every day. Like I can't even tell, I'm, I study harder right now than I ever did in any of my degree programs mm -hmm. because the research is changing so quickly. And I tell my graduate students that every year, this is cohort eight that just started this summer. Right. And these clinicians, mental health therapists, educators, administrators are coming in with much more knowledge than cohort one or cohort two, because the field traumatology is evolving, relational and social neurosciences is evolving, polyvagal, um, the, the work is evolving. But here's what I really want to say this afternoon. It's not what you know, it is really what you embody. 
Mm -hmm. So, and I'm going to emphasize this to my graduate students because I'm walking that walk too. It's not the, it's not the knowledge, you know, that in, it's not the templates that you create, but, you know, are we truly embodying it in our lives? And, and do we really, do we really um, just sense it, experience it in our own nervous systems? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's important. I wanted to spend, I, I hope this hasn't been negative. I hope it's been hopeful. Um, but I do want to spend some time talking about some things that we can do. I don't, I, well, I you, to you know, it, it's funny you say that because, um, I w I was thinking, um, just a moment ago, like, okay, we know the impact we know kind of broadly, like that we've been, you know, that, as a society, we've been doing these things. We've been doing them for a long time. Uh, and, and I was actually going to ask you, like, what's the hope? Give us hope. What can be done? How can we change things? Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I acknowledged in, in your intro, and, and I feel it in my, my heart here, that uh, the work that you're doing with the Applied Educational Neuroscience Program uh, is, is making waves and ripples and changes in the world. But speak more broadly. I mean, what can we do? I mean, what, what, where, where do you see the hope and what can be done um, to help move things forward? Well, I, first of all, the, the hope is plasticity. Um, and I want everyone to understand that the nervous system has plasticity. And Deb Dana talks about that. Um, you know, she's a very well-known trauma therapist that works alongside Dr. Porges. It's not just the brain that has plasticity. Our nervous system has plasticity. And that is so hopeful. And that's what I talk about. In, that's the title of the book, Intentional Neuroplasticity. Um, and really, Guy, it's, it, you know, it, it, it really is about our awareness. And I want to say awareness is transformational. You just don't think that it is. But um, I, and I, I want to read this to you. I wrote this down. And this is just, this is when we have awareness that I, that, that I am pissed off. Like when I am aware, which I was like three nights ago, our grandson is here. My mom stopped over. Nellie, our rescue dog was being ridiculously jealous. I jumped on Nellie. I was short with Michael. I was so dysregulated, my husband, I was so dysregulated and I, I've never gotten that angry at Nellie, our rescue mm -hmm. dog. Because mm -hmm. she, and, and I stepped back and I thought, oh my God. I mean, look, like I just, like the, I escalated everybody in the room, including my mom who was annoying me, but she couldn't help it. Her cognition, her memory, she's struggling right now. And mm -hmm. I dysregulated. So I just want to say, and, and I'm going to finish this now, not only is awareness transformational, awareness provides predictability. Mm -hmm. And when we have predictability, when we know that we could be uptight when we know that this kid triggers us, when we know this student activates us, when we know this colleague, when we know this time of day is frustrating, when you know your dips and valleys, then we can get out ahead of it. So, and, and I just, I love that. I can think about, okay, this is going to be a day. So I have the ability to really um, get in front of this with some deep breathing, with some, I love yoga nidra. It's, it's a new, it's, um, it's, it's not new at all. It's ancient practice, but um, it's being well researched right now at UCLA and it's an awake sleep. So I can do that for 10 minutes. I can drink a cold bottle of water. I can walk for five minutes. Um, I can hum. I mean, these are things that we now know these practices can can really begin to shift, mm. um, you know, our nervous system states. So I, I you know, I want to share that. That's hopeful. Mm -hmm. I also, wanna, I also want to talk about. Um, oh yes, that was something. That's okay. I'll come back to that. But um, I want to emphasize that this work in our classrooms, when we think about discipline, it is really about morning meeting discipline happens at the beginning of class. 
I, I just cannot emphasize that enough. It is preventative. It is relational. It's nervous system aligned. I know, Guy, you've heard this at nauseum, but it's really getting out in front of the behavior. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a very challenging school district on Tuesday that had never heard of this work. And they were like reading their nonverbal. It was real. I was so challenged. But then I began to model it. And I showed a video of the angry monster and they had to predict the ending. And then we talked about, I mean, you got to walk the walk. So I just want to say, what are the first 10 minutes of class how, how do children experience that? How does the end of the day, how are we being intentional about co-regulatory practices? Are we, are we being intentional about um, being aware of our nervous systems? Are we providing predictability and routines that are engaging and practices that address our sensory systems, whether it's some rhythm, whether it's some movement, whether it's some intentional breathing, whether it's some pressure, whether it's some laughter, whether it's some fun predictability or something salient or novel. Those are ways that we get our kids to the cortex. Mm. When you're in the cortex, then we can reason, we can you know, emotionally regulate, we can hold good, strong working memory and sustained attention. Um, we are, I, I always, share with um, teachers that I sit beside to offer a child a podcast for a minute, a motivational podcast while they're um, co-regulating, listen to it together, um, watch an ins inspirational, motivational three minute YouTube video, doing it with them, sharing a bottle of water with a student. Um, and, and something that I've never said in any of my presentations, this is the first time I've ever said that, I want to, I'm going to talk this year about um, snack. Let me think what I'm going to say. So snack chats. And I, this comes from watching my daughter, Sarah, have milk chats with Miles this week. After Miles has finished nursing, she will literally lay him in her arms. And she looks in his eyes. Her face is soft and her voice is low. And she holds him tightly and she speaks to him and he is cooing and gurgling and talking with her. And he is in a state of relaxed alertness. And I thought to myself this week, one of the ways that we can get out ahead of the behavior is really be intentional about snack chats with our children. Now, somebody's going to roll their eyes at me and say, are you kidding me? I've got 35 kids. How in the hell am I going to do that? And I want to share with you, it is a process. We got to get out in front of it. If we know which students are really coming in rough, if we know which students are carrying in mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. behavior, right. and you know that we all, I mean, we know we can look at our data. We know then we're intentional with these touch points where we sit down, share a cracker, share a bottle of water, share a spoonful of peanut butter. And, and we just, um, we just are sharing our safe, emotionally available presence. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things I've written down quite a few, but mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. are in our, this is all the work in, that we do in our procedures, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's to the plate. It's so, so I know you had uh, some slides that you talked about um, sharing. Did you want to bring any of those up and share them? Because it'd be great to share some of those. And, and I just want to kind of prime the, and I'm going to go ahead and bring this up on the screen here as well. But I also want to prime the, uh, the audience here that's watching uh, that if you have questions uh, or comments, uh, please put those in the chat. And in a few minutes, we'll try to transition here to some questions that we might have from our audience. So I've got your PowerPoint up on the screen. And right now it's a circle of culture. Um, so I don't know where you wanted to start, but, uh, we can yeah. see your screen. Yeah. So, um, okay. So this is, and I know, um, so what I'm, I'm thinking this year, so many of our black and brown students, so many of our transgender youth, so many of our immigration youth, our special education population, um, you know, are, are, 
our children of color, there, there is such a misunderstanding of culture and, um, and our children lose their sense of identity. They lose, and I'm not talking about surface identity. You know, I really want to, I want to talk about, um, looking at the circle of culture. So I, I, I did this five minutes before I went on, but if I'm in the center of it, I want to know what my students value. I want to know their belief systems. Mm -hmm. I want to know, and I want them to be able to share their community experiences, the traditions in their home, the traditions that are in their families. Um, you know, I want to, I want to talk about ancestry, you know, and, and how, you know, our ancestors impact how we feel and experience the world today. And so these, this is actually, this is from an article and I can send this to everyone. It's from education week. Mm. And, um, and so this is something I would like to do this year. You know, I would really like to delve in and, and to really look at, you know, what we call these circles of culture so that we can begin to really, um, deeply understand and embody, um, you know, where our children, where our adolescents and where our families, you know, are coming from. And Guy, I want to say too, that for many of our parents, school was not a, you know, school right. was a traumatizing right. experience. Right. right. I mean, school can be terrifying, you know, for many families. Um, and, and again, that's not, you know, school's the de facto. This yeah, is and, and we bring those experiences with us as our, our children go to school as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I shared before, but I mean, I uh, very young was at a school that practiced corporal punishment. And yeah, I mean, I experienced corporal punishment when I was in kindergarten. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, we, we bring these experiences with us and, um, you know, it's tough. It is. It's just, it's really hard. So a goal for me this year, and a couple of my grad students are on fire with this. Rob Belts, who's been on the show with you before, um, Dustin Springer. Um, we've been doing, uh, we've been talking a lot about nests, and so this is the last thing I'm going to share. Can I? Can we move? Can I move my PowerPoint, or do you move? You it? should be able to move your PowerPoint. Um, so if you just click on the left side there, you should be able to move to a different slide if you'd like to. Oh, gotcha. You, you'll have oh, to be on your PowerPoint um, presentation though. Okay, hold on. So I'm going to go to. Uh, okay, so I should I hit your stop sharing and go to mine now? Uh oh, I think we lost your share there. So you, you might have to reshare it. Okay, let me share. Hold okay, on. Sure. sure. And if you want to get to the screen time. first, that wouldn't even simplify things. Okay, so I'm going to share screen, share screen. I'm just not good at this part. Okay, then I'm going to go to the window. Yep, go to the window and then choose your PowerPoint. Here it is. Okay. Okay. And it just came up on the screen and just change whatever slide you were on. Yep. I see you yep. scrolling. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So I want to go down here. Oh my goodness. There's okay. So this is something that we're going to be talking about in class. I just want to share a couple of these um, really quickly. So not only do people um, so co-regulation is our ability to you know, share our safe, emotionally available space and nervous system with a child. And it's, that's, again, we are social creatures. So when you think about, and I'm gonna go back here. So the polyvagal chart, this is a new one that we've created that shows when you like are in this green area, we're functioning from our cortex, we are feeling focused and connected and safe and grounded. And then we might, you know, um, someone might give us a look, we might get annoyed, we feel anxious, something's happened in the halls, in the lunchroom at recess, we come in and we are irritated and we move into that survival state of fight flight. And then we, um, you know, if, if, if we are not having those co-regulatory experiences in that time and space to find some groundedness and some steadiness, then we can move even further down, regulate into shutdown, which is that immobilized frozen. And for many of our children and adolescents, this is disconnecting from themselves and disconnecting from the world around them, like crawling under your desk, run, you know, uh, not running so much, but just retreating. Um, for us, it's just 
It could look like failing grades. It could look like, you know, hoods over our heads, mm -hmm. um, high absences. So if you see these colors, then I want to take you also our schools hold places. And Guy, you heard me share this. I CPI, mm -hmm. I think. Um, mm -hmm. That our schools hold places that feel safe and hold places that feel um, where we get ramped up or where we feel anxious. So the green are areas in a building that feel safe to staff and to students. I'm showing you a student one. Um, and we are just beginning to kind of share this, but we, as a school, we can give our adult surveys and we can give student surveys with three or four simple questions. Um, and I'm going to be developing this this year, but you know, what hallways feel safe to you? Where do you feel connected? Are there restrooms that can activate you or trigger you? Are there places that feel terrifying? in the building. What about the parking lot? What about the playground? Um, you know, and, and so the reason this is so important for us in our schools is to really think about the people in those places, the aesthetics in those places, um, you know, the, just mm -hmm. the, the experiences and, and the felt experiences that our students have. So this is one way that we can really begin to gather as a staff, um, the information and, and, and then support and resource those spaces. You, you know, Lori, this is popping something. I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is popping something off my brain here. And I was thinking about uh, conversations I've had with uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Ann Huxhorn, who did a lot of work around um, reducing and eliminating restraint seclusion and acute psychiatric care over 20 years ago. And, and one of the, the points that you made, I'm just thinking about this idea of safety. Um, yeah. As you see people focused on safety, very often they're focused on the wrong things. And, and, and don't get me wrong, what, what I'm trying to say here is that very often in focusing on safety, we end up hardening schools to look like secure facilities, to look like prisons, and, and those don't feel safe to a nervous system. And, and Dr. Huxhorn made a, a great point about like, you know, uh, what if facilities, whether it be schools or acute psychiatric facilities, took cues from the hospitality industry, right? Rather than rather than trying to harden places so that they, you know, you're passing through metal detectors and you have things that uh, look very much in some cases like a prison, uh, it really can in it really can uh, affect a sense of personal safety. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, we want to know, like, our you know, and this also empowers our kids. You know, and, and it gives them, you know, some voice and some choice and 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 they feel like they are a, they are a part of that. They've got some purpose, maybe some mastery, you know, that that circle of belonging is activated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also for our staff, you know, this is true, too. So the la just the last couple of things I wanted to share. This is discipline. You know, we don't think of this when kids walk into a classroom. This is Emily Ross. She's a sixth grade teacher that I've worked closely with over the last few years. And, um, you know, when kids come in, they're opening up Chromebooks, they're opening up their tabs, they're having, you know, breakfast. Um, they have these, she, Emily shares as magnetic brains, you know, and so they, they move them all day long, you know, like, where are you in your nervous system? And not only do we gather fabulous perceptual data, you know, like as a teacher, this is invaluable for me mm -hmm. to, to know, but, um, you know, we can, we can also, we give the kids an opportunity to name. And you know what Dan Siegel has said for so long, you know, when you, when you can name that, you know, okay. it dampens down the stress response. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you'll have to have Emily get in touch with us. I'd love to have her write something about oh, that. Yeah. She's, yeah. Yeah. She's amazing. Um, okay. And then the last thing that I wanted to share this is really super cool. Um, this is from, and this is Emily's too, Emily Ross. And she is on fire with this work with her middle school, sixth grade students. And she is taking neuroplasticity into her content area. And that's why, you know, she says, Lori, I just don't have the behaviors that I used to have because mm -hmm. she's weaving it into everything. So they were doing a unit on fractions. And what she did was she asked the kids to draw pathways 
um, you know, is your understanding of fractions, you know, specific, you can see like decimals, um, converting to improper fractions. Do you understand numerator and denominators? Are you on a dirt road, a paved road, or do you have a super highway for this? And so, you know, thinking about, um, you know, social and emotional learning is not like, it's not from 10 to 1030. Um, if we are really going to shift um, the way that we like really emphasize the social and emotional growth of our students, this, we've got to integrate this all day long. And I love this example of how she is using this um, way of engagement, not only, um, you know, integrating it into content area, but she is, the kids love this. I mean, they're learning about neuroplasticity in so many different ways. So I'll stop sharing now. I just wanted to share those few slides with you. Yeah, and that's fantastic. And, and you know, um, your work has demonstrated um, the power of kind of some awareness about your brain, whether you're you know, whether you're four years old or you're 40 years old, uh, understanding your, your brain and your nervous system. And there's, you know, I love teaching this and normalizing and, and you know, uh, I mean, it sounds like Emily's doing some amazing work. Um, and, you know, you, you talk about how she said she just doesn't have the behaviors anymore. And what always resonates with me is like, what's the biggest change? The biggest change was Emily, right? Uh, it's not that those, you know, 30 some children are different. In fact, they could still be going to other classrooms and, and having some difficulty, but the changes that we make in ourselves and how much impact that has then over supporting kids. And I think, you know, we probably have a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the families and parents that are part of our community that have seen that, that have seen a kid move to a different environment with somebody with a different mindset and suddenly they have a different child, right? It's, I'm so glad that we, you said that guy that you ended with that today because you know, it's, it's the kids didn't make the shift. Emily made the shift and, right. um, and that's just so critical and it's a process, you know, yeah, it's absolutely. Process. It's absolutely. So, so I know we, we've gone not long, but we're, we're about the time that we would normally end, but we have a couple of, well, actually Courtney has been busy putting blue stars on things that she thought we might want to ask questions of. Do you have time for a few questions? Absolutely. Okay, so I'm, I'm just kind of rolling my way through here because they they go way back here. But but let me let me just start with a few of them. Uh, I've got a question here that um, seems like a uh, a good question to, to send your way. Um, what makes a good teacher? So, given your experience in education, given uh, you know the work that you do now, uh, and of course you know realizing that people are on a journey. So we don't want to say that somebody's a bad teacher that that really is on a journey to be a better teacher. But what do you think makes a good teacher? Oh, I, well, there are so many, I mean, so many facets to this question, but in my gut, the first thing that just came to me is a teacher that is so willing and so excited to keep learning. Um, I just, I feel like, I just feel like, you know, that is just critical in this time. The students that, you know, some of our educators had even five years ago are the, not the students of today. They have a different biology based on external, internal, and relational environments that they've been exposed to. And we're, we are still crisis teaching. We are still mm -hmm. pandemic teaching. Um, and we will be this year. So I, I feel like what makes a good teacher is just somebody who continually is willing and excited to learn about themselves first and foremost and about um what is underneath that behavior and what they can do to, to align with where the student is in their nervous system. Yeah, that, that's great. And, and, you know, I would say that, that even much of it is like somebody that's showing up for kids, right? Somebody that's yeah. showing up for kids, uh, somebody that wants to always do better, you know? Um, yeah, there's so much. Uh, Katie said, do you have any tips? And, and this is a great question. Do you have any tips on how to bridge the gap between behavior specialists in the school coming from a behaviors perspective and other practitioners who are trying to focus more on regulation? So, you know, this is something that we see. And of course, it varies from school to school and district to district. But, you know, as you know, Lori, very often uh, the ideas around uh, discipline are based on, you know, well, they're probably the opposite of your book title. They're often based on compliance. They're often based on reward and, and consequence. So what are your tips for um, 
you know, bringing people on board that may be coming from a different perspective or background? So uh, my two answer or two response, not answers, two responses to this. Um, the first one is to build relationships with each other. Um, it, you know, when we have, you know, some adults that are really focused on the behavioral piece and we have some adults that are focused on what is underneath that behavior and really looking at the sensory system, there can be a significant collision and we dig our heels in more and we become more resistant when we feel a need to defend ourselves. So I think that strengthening relationships in your building um, between the adults is so critical. And then I would also, and this is something that, you know, I'm always thinking about too, is, is there a classroom in a building? Um, is there a space where the work is, where there are educators that are um, really showing a different discipline protocol because they are reaching for sustainable change rather than just compliance or obedience. And so I would encourage Katie, you know, to really those, there are many educators who intuitively get this work. And, um, and so I think it's really helpful in a building to maybe create a pilot classroom, you know, where um, we can show data, you know, where we can, you know, really when, when there is an educator that is using the applied educational neuroscience, you know, the, the framework and being trauma responsive in a way that they're tying that into their discipline protocols, because, you know, a trauma response, you can bring in me, you can bring in other speakers, but the work comes from within the building and it's all about discipline in the end, a trauma responsive school, a school that has shifted their discipline. Great, great response. Uh, Cassie says, would you say it is unsafe for students to be in shutdown? So if a student is in a dissociative, immobilized, shutdown state, um, I mean, I don't want to generalize that because, you know, our nervous systems are unique and so are our responses. So, I mean, I, I think that if a student has moved into that, we need to know that that is a state of feeling terrified. Um, and so that is a, a, a state, that's state dependent functioning where that student needs an adult. Um, to sit beside them. So, um, and, and again, if you can't run from your stressor and you can't fight off your stressor, then our nervous systems move into that shutdown dissociative. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that can be, I, I mean, that's a much, for me, that's a much more challenging autonomic nervous system state. Mm -hmm. I'd rather see a kid running, fighting than shutting down yeah. because that disconnect you know, you know, what's interesting from a slightly different angle is that, you know, um, kids that are running, kids that are pushing desk over, kids that are having big behaviors, um, there is often focus put on kids. And, and you know, let, let's look in both directions and say sometimes that's not a good thing. Sometimes these are kids that are being over over restrained, secluded, suspended, expelled. But but also these are kids that draw attention and, and may, in fact, depending on where they are, be getting positive help. Uh, the concern, you know, around shutdown is that there are kids that are shut down, that are in the back of the class with a hoodie over their head and 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 may not be eliciting any response because the thought is they're not they're not causing disruption. And, and some of these kids are really suffering, I think, in silence. So, you know, sometimes I think it can be, you know, quite. Um, unfortunate for a kid that, that goes into that shutdown because they may fall through the cracks, right? Absolutely. And we call those our invisible kids, right. you know, because a school pays more attention guy, like you said so well, I mean, we look at externalizing behaviors, you know, we don't look at those internalizing ones. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm just going to share a couple of comments here. We're going we're to wrap up and unfortunately I won't get to everything, but I'm going to share a couple more comments here and then give you an opportunity for any final words that you have. Uh, and this was just a comment as you were talking through, uh, I think of how this would have helped me as a student to be heard. Uh, it would have settled me. And, uh, you know, Connie jumped on and said, you know, <laughs> same thing, lifelong learner. Uh, uh, Rochelle mentioned kind of starting with the adult, which we talked about being so important. Uh, it seems like a lot of uh, a lot of love and support for what you're doing. I had a, a great comment here from uh, uh, Gail who said, uh, Dr. Lurie, you inspire me every time I hear you. 
what keeps going around in my head is how can I get this work to teachers in school? A huge task is particularly when their hearts and minds are not open. And I know we addressed that a few minutes ago. And, you know, I, I think one thing I would, you know, add is like, you know, always have conversations, even with people that don't agree with you. And, and one of the things that I've found in doing this work is that uh, there are times that, you know, I might mentally think, oh, no, 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 no. We, 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 we're in very different places. We're not going to come to the same thing. But sometimes when you have conversations, you realize um, and you can align and you can make connection. And uh, even if you go in with very different views, sometimes just giving it the opportunity, uh, you find out about the opportunity to work with people that you might not have expected to. Um, so, you know, there's always hope, I think. So, oh, okay. yeah, go ahead, Lori. I'm sorry. No, no. I just think, um, you know, this was, you know, we were, I think we were very candid today. And, um, and I think that, you know, the nervous system has a negative bias. So all of us will, you know, really pay attention to the negative. It gets our attention, um, because we are wired for survival. But, um, you know, in saying that, um, there is such a power in um, human spirit and in the plasticity of the nervous system. And Absolutely. I just, yeah, I just feel like when we understand that um, anytime we are elevated and our kids are elevated, we are functioning, you know, in um, this survival, protective, defensive state. Um, we are, uh, we, we just, we, we just have to realize that we have to step back. We may not be able to stop it in the moment, but just thinking about where I was, um, where this child was and knowing that survival is what the nervous system is about. And absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, and so, those um, yeah. Um, yeah. Just getting thanked here for your your wisdom uh, and candor, and and all this applies to so many different disciplines. Um, Lori, uh, I want to give you an opportunity for any last word that you had, although that that was a, a great last word too. Uh, any anything final that you want to share with us as we wrap up today? Well, just that. Thank you, Guy. Um, I just want to share that the stories, you know, our trauma stories, our um, stories of private logic are held in our autonomic pathways. Um, and, and that's where we've got to focus, you know, just to understand that our experiences have created, um, you know, how we perceive um, the world around us. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Well, no, th thank you. And, and, you know, always appreciative and, uh, you know, really appreciate the, the work that you're doing and, you know, appreciate who you are and what you're doing and, and, and all the, the good that you're bringing to the world. Uh, you know, I want to encourage people that if, if you, you know, find this really as interesting and fascinating as I do, uh, the uh, Applied Educational Neuroscience Program at Butler University is an amazing program and uh, people that want to dive in deeper. And I know we actually have probably quite a few people that have been in the program on our event today. Uh, so that's great to see. So, Lori, thank you so much. If you want to hang around for a second, I'll give you a final goodbye and we'll say goodbye to our audience here today uh appreciate all of you uh, appreciate all of you that are coming you know every every two weeks or every week when we do these events um you know this community that we have here um is really empowering and i think uh you know we're, we're working to spread good things so uh it always makes my heart happy to know uh how many people join us from all over the world and the work that you're doing so thank you all and we will see you again next week we have a, another live event coming and laura you can hang on and we'll say goodbye to everybody here bye-bye